This episode of Take Facts is sponsored by Gotta Go Back. The company bringing your childhood Sonic OCs to life. I'm in a front to God and man. It is Iron Lads. 26 electrons, yes, it has. Okay, not my finest effort, but there's a good tune in there somewhere. Gram for gram, iron is the most common metal on Earth, and the main component of the planet's core, the delectable hazelnut centre of the enormous Ferrero Rocher we call our home. Iron is easily the most important metallic element in human civilization. So important, in fact, it's the only element with an entire age dedicated to it. Yeah, nice try, copper and tin, I know it's you guys under that trench coat. Academically speaking, the term Iron Age is a bit hand-wavy. A slew of different civilizations discovered iron smithing independently of one another. So depending on which parts of the world you consider to be based or cringe, the start of the Iron Age can vary by hundreds of years. The earliest Iron Age we know of kicked off around three and a half thousand years ago, when a group of lads in modern-day Turkey called the Hittites made two groundbreaking discoveries. One, if you stack a crucible full of charcoal and rust-coloured rocks, and then, to use a technical term, heat the bejesus out of it, you can extract a nice liquid metal that can be shaped by pouring it into moulds. And number two, a nice shape for a mould is a long rectangle with a pointy bit at the end. Steel is an invention that's changed society as fundamentally as the wheel, indoor light, and those little plastic tags you use to stop bread from going stale. By the time I finish making videos on the elements in the D block, the phrase used in steel production will probably appear more times in the subtitles than the letter E. The practical and economic utility of every element on Earth hinges on how nicely its chemistry meshes with irons, but like a fine red wine and seven servings of Christmas dinner, no element element pairs better with iron than carbon, an element that coincidentally is the main component of fine red wines, Christmas dinners, and the elderly relatives sharing racist views over the Christmas crackers. By definition, steel is any alloy whose primary component is iron with less than 2% carbon content. If the carbon content is any higher, you wind up in the territory of cast iron, an alloy traditionally used as a cheap, malleable alternative to steel that has since found a niche as a component in frying pans. The main culinary competitor of cast iron is stainless steel, an alloy with at least 10.5% chromium to improve resistance to corrosion, although in modern formulations it's usually closer to 20, plus or minus a bit of nickel for good measure. There are pros and cons to both cast iron and stainless steel, all of which I will now rattle off like a 1960s door-to-door -door salesman trying to flog my tat to a housewife on her fifth whiskey sour of the afternoon. Cast iron pans hold heat well, making them particularly useful for searing meat. Nowadays they have a reputation as being a bit bougie, tainted by association with men in their 20s that spend a bit too much time on cooking subreddits, but there's a reason people were using these things before the Norman invasion of England, you can pick up second-hand cast iron cookware for next to nothing. Even if they're in pretty rough shape, you can usually restore them to near new condition in the space of an hour or so, and they'll basically last forever if you take proper care of them. Emphasis on if. Looking after a cast iron pan takes practice. To make sure your food cooks evenly, you need to build up a non-stick layer of seasoning on the surface of the pan. A layer that takes time and care to maintain that will be steadily eroded away by acidic ingredients such as tomatoes and vinegar. You also need to make sure to dry it properly once you finish using it. Here's a bit of inorganic chemistry you can take to culinary school. Beads of tap water plus cast iron pan plus several days in a poorly ventilated kitchen cupboard yields a knackered bit of cookware and a very annoyed housemate. After prolonged exposure to oxygen, iron will form iron 3 oxide, a brownish red solid colloquially known as rust. Stainless steel doesn't rust because there's a thin protective layer of chromium oxide protecting the iron from undergoing oxidation. That was clear enough to me when I was doing my G CSEs, but one thing I didn't understand was why pure iron didn't oxidise at all in dry air. The atmosphere is 21% oxygen after all. Surely if you immersed a block of it in air after a few hours, it wouldn't stand a chance. It would be like putting an unaccompanied schoolboy in the waiting room of the BBC in the 1970s. What my teenage self didn't understand, the little simpleton, is that there's a difference between oxygen the element and oxygen the gas. O2 molecules are kept together with strong oxygen-oxygen double bonds. To break this bond, the O2 molecule has to steal electrons from the iron atoms. Problem is, air is a bad conductor of electricity, so this process is far too slow to be noticeable under standard conditions. Water, on the other hand, is a great medium for electrons to flow through, especially if it has lots of metal ions. With a nice layer of water to bridge the gap between iron and O2, electrons can readily flow from the iron atoms to the oxygen. Also, while the term rust and iron 3 oxide are used interchangeably even among chemists, true rust is actually a hodgepodge of ferric oxyhydroxide and hydrated iron oxides. It's also the name 
name of a popular programming language, known for its efficiency, robust compiler, and a learning curve that eases up somewhere around the K2 death zone. Not content with being the most abundant element on Earth, Ion's reign of terror has spread to all of the other planets in the solar system, chief among them Mars, named after the Roman god of war and the deep-fried snack terrorising the wastelands of the Scottish. Mars is not a nice place, and it probably won't get much nicer once billionaires get to the surface and start constructing a ring of luxury villas and forced labour camps in the shape of Big Chungus. Mars is coated with a layer of finely grained, highly toxic dust. While we've yet to bring back any samples of Martian dust to Earth, analysis conducted by the Curiosity rover confirmed the presence of toxic perchlorate salts, as well as trace amounts of poisonous metals such as beryllium, arsenic, and cadmium. Martian dust is also magnetic and a good conductor of static electricity, which makes it great for clinging to spacesuits, rovers, and anything else that happens to touch the ground. And if any of this easily breathable poison gets tracked back into the ship, not to worry, what's nine months of transit time in a big metal box with limited air supply anyway? An iron ore known as hematite is common on the surface of Mars, so common in fact it was thought to be the primary cause of the planet's colour. Notice I said was, not is. Until 2008 there was no conclusive evidence of water on Mars, so planetary scientists assumed that anhydrous iron oxides had to be the source of the planet's rusty hue. But a paper published in Nature Communications this February theorised that the real culprit is poorly crystalline ferrohydrite, a hydrated iron complex that matches the colour and spectroscopic data of Martian dust far more accurately than hematite on its own. Crystalline ferrohydrite is most commonly created in the presence of cool water, so it likely formed about 3 billion years ago, when there were still rivers and seas on Mars's surface. But as Mars transitioned from an Atlantean paradise to a poisonous barren desert, the ferrohydrite was broken down into dust and swept across the planet's surface by the wind. On that note, have you guys ever watched The Martian? Pretty good, it got seven Oscar nominations and features Matt Damon eating potatoes grown from his own poo. After being struck by a calamitous dust storm on the surface of Mars, a team of astronauts is forced to leave Matt Damon's character for dead after he gets knocked on his ass by a bit of debris. On paper, this is a decent setup for a film based on Mars. Planets spanning dust storms engulf Mars at least once a year, sometimes raging for over a month at a time. Working around those storms is going to be a major pain in the ass for the wannabe Martian settlers of the future. Not only will they hamper visibility, the operation of machinery, and the construction of any habitats on the surface, but it'll play havoc with the settlers' power supplies. Unless someone at NASA comes up with a design for a perpetual motion device the size of a Kit Kat chunky, Martian explorers will probably get their energy from two sources, solar power and nuclear fission, the latter of which requires hazardous material to be continuously shipped around the solar system. But if one of those dust storms wipes out every solar panel on the planet's surface for four weeks, the astronauts better hope there's some juice left in their plutonium steam decks. One fact that both the film and the book quietly pass over is that Mars's atmosphere is about 2% as dense as Earth's is. A planet encompassing storm of death sounds scary until you realise the strongest winds would feel like little more than a light breeze, certainly not enough to knock astronauts to the ground. Still, let's not take this too seriously. It's fun to nitpick, but if a film's entertaining, I don't care if writers take liberties with the science. This isn't the chemistry wing of cinema sins. That source of pedantry was cringe back in 2014, and anyone that takes such analysis with an ounce of seriousness should be pelted with rotten fruit in the town square. Why no, little Timmy, I didn't know that Back to the Future isn't scientifically accurate. Say, you should do an experiment to prove it to me. Here's a DMC DeLorean and some plutonium. Try driving it into a wall at 88 miles an hour. Come on, little Timmy, don't be shy, all your friends are watching. Oh wait, you've not got any, have you? You little saddo. Well, men, ladies, maidens, and giants, I hope you enjoyed the video. It's time to bring down the curtain and turn off my mic. Let me know in the comments if I chefed anything out. Thanks for taking a chance -la on me. Like, like Otto van Bismarck, come on, like, that was good. Reopen the schools.